If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation 19, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse, uh, Revelation 19, uh, in the very first verse. The Bible says, And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he have judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and have avenged the blood of his servants by at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And the smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell, at, fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it was a voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for an opportunity to be with your people tonight. Lord, we thank you that uh, in this place we can shut out the world just for a little while. Lord, we pray tonight that you would allow us to worship you in spirit and truth and we wouldn't be drugged down by what the world has to give us, but rather we'd be... Uh, buoyed up by your word, Lord, that we'd be uh, thrilled to be looking in on your word tonight and be able to feast on your sayings. We will give you the praise and the glory for it all, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, the book uh, of Revelation, giving us a, a peephole into last things, is uh, one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible. Uh, I probably don't understand it nearly as I should, but this one, this section, is fairly easy to understand. Uh, in the beginning, it says, after these things. Now, if you'll read chapter 18, and we're not going to for the time's sake tonight, but what they had done, what God Almighty had done, is judge the great poor. Now, the great whore is the Catholic Church and all her daughters that run around even today, and they were judged in that manner. Now, uh, we never should be satisfied with being called Protestants or protesters because we are not. We predated all the stuff that went down in the 16th century. We are beyond that, and our, our, our teachings go back to the days of Christ. But that did come up. In the third century, Constantine the Great uh, got together of a, of a band, and really what it was was idolatry. They were worshiping the cross. They weren't worshiping Christ. And, and that went with them evermore, and again and again and again. She's multiplied herself. She gave birth to the Lutherans. She gave birth to the Presbyterians. She gave birth to the Methodists. And on and on and on we could go. But we see this as, a, as, a, as being judged completely. You know, we can't even fathom when that's set aside. Now, uh, I don't like when people ask me what religion I am. Because, see, this is the thing of it. Religion will get you into deep trouble. Yeah. Religion will make you think you have something that you do not. Right. Uh, religion is dangerous in every aspect of the world. And so I would much rather be a Christian completely saved from the sin of my own self than be called a Christian. And so we see that that judgment has occurred. In midway of the verse, they say, Hallelujah, salvation. Now, you think about your average Baptist church meeting. Even
even a Wednesday night meeting, how many people do you say, hallelujah? I've never heard it. Have you? Uh, and I've been in church a long, long time. I, I've never even heard a hallelujah. Have you? Now, maybe when I was a young boy, maybe. Uh, but I want you to see what they were doing and what that uh, word really means is we worship God. That He is our center, uh, our center, excuse me, and that He everything is after His own will. Hallelujah! And I believe the reason we don't do that uh, more than we do is uh, we're ashamed of it. Also carries the meaning of true and mighty. That's who our God is. He's always truthful. <laughs> He's mighty beyond our understanding. And we should give him praise. Now, men, if I understand the Bible correctly, that's your responsibility. When we're made to, together to be assembled as a body, the Bible says the women are to, uh, to remain in silence. So that puts the whole burden of praise, verbal praise, to me and you. Hallelujah! Uh, you know what? If you did that in a few Baptist meetings, they'd tag you as Pentecostal and never invite you back. <coughs> right? And, and, and so we see then that this example of rejoicing, at, what they're really rejoicing is over sound judgment. That God judged the whore justly and took care of the problem through false doctrine in a pit forevermore. Because when, when the devil comes back after the millennial reign, see, the whore's not with him anymore because she has been defeated. And, and so we find then uh, many times we experience things in our life that deserve an hallelujah and we don't give it. Right. Amen. You, you know, we, we may mumble, well, I sure thank the Lord for it. Do you? Mm. Do you really? Now, I believe if we really grabbed hold of the God that we serve, hallelujah, would be on our lips, and we would be able to say it with, with some conviction and some power. Verse 2, true and righteous, righteous are his judgments. Now, let me say this, church. It's not your place to judge uh, because you, you, you're not good at it. I, I, I'll, I'll say that certainly. Can we look at something and, uh, and the fruit on an apple tree and say, yeah, that's an apple tree, but you don't judge the apple tree. Uh, you, you know, is it whole apples or sound apples? I don't know. Don't, you, you don't judge it. And should we take in with the filth of this world? Certainly not. But you leave the judgment up to God because he's a lot more sound judge than you'll ever be. And, and, and so we find then that they're rejoicing because God gave them an adequate, true judgment of what was happening, of the truth that was, that, that was occurring. Then uh, notice what it says in the rest of verse 2. For he had judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and avenge the blood of his servants at her hand. Now, I want you to see the word fornication is a sexual uh, a union outside the marriage bond. And, and, and God's people should never be involved in that. I've seen it a lot of times. I've seen where people have gotten that relationship. And the reason I believe this is used here is because what, it, what does fornication do? It defiles you. It, it makes you some. It, it makes you where you're no longer pure. Uh, and you know what, boys? That's men and girls apart uh, alike. You know, used to it was a shame and a disgrace. Even in the '80s, when I was young, it, if a girl came up pregnant, man, it was a problem. But what about the boys? She didn't get pregnant on her own, did she? That's right. And you never heard one one word about that. And so we find here the shame that's produced about this. And, and, and what does fornication often end up with? A child. Mm -hmm. Now today, well, they've about got that sin taken care of too. But in the days that the Bible was written, what came forth from that problem was a child. And so the great whore has begat and begat and begat 
And you know what it was? It was to make their doctrine a little less offensive. And so they compromised and compromised and compromised. But don't ever forget, she is exactly who and what she says she is. And so we find that that filth is what is judged. Verse 3, and they, and again they said, hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Right. Now the only thing I can see really about this, first it's an endless fire, and maybe that smoke is worshipful, I don't know. Brother Jarrett can give us some insight onto how that would if, if that would fit any end to the sacrificial offerings. I, I, don't, I don't see that to myself, but somehow this was praiseworthy. It was the thing to do. It was the thing that brought him glory, meaning the Lord God. Verse 4, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! Now, you think about tonight, or you think about the next fellowship meeting, or brother, when you're out preaching, or brother Jared, when you're filling in with somebody, and you just lay down and said, hallelujah, what would happen? I guarantee you wouldn't be invited back, right? But that was worship, was it not? They were worship, and you know, it all was from this, it simply... That, that a work of God that was true and right had occurred. You know, when we see a miraculous work of God, this ought to be always the response. Mm -hmm. How long has it been since you've seen someone saved? I guess the last one I've seen, seen saved was Sarah. And oh, what a blessing it was. But you know what? I didn't fall down either. You didn't either. Man, that was a miraculous event that, you know, some people say, I've never seen a miracle. Boy, I have. I, I experienced a miracle when the Lord saved me. A lot of people say, because my health ain't as good as the next guy. Oh, what a wonderful miracle. No, no. Uh, my brain surgery wasn't a miracle. My heart being cleared up wasn't, it was a physical miracle. But you know, far beyond that, the day the Lord saved me, how exceeding and glorious and wonderful that was, far beyond what anything this this little body is. You know what? Even with all that the Lord has spared me from, this body's going to play out one day. That's right. And what will really last is what he did for me and, and saving my near, never dying so. And they understood that and they worshipped him. Verse 5, the voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. So we find a command here, both small and great, and I really don't know what that means. Maybe some people with large ministries or some people with a large amount of influence, and some maybe like myself that, that, that don't influence a whole lot of people, every one of them, he says, praise ye the Lord. Man, that's something to say, isn't it? Everything. You know, if uh, everybody, and he, he visited with us, that little man downtown that holds up his sign. Mm -hmm. uh, what if we did that? Jesus saves. The Lord omnipotent reigneth. Man, they'd have to look that one up, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. They'd be on their phone. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be good for money. To look it up and say, oh, wow. He reigneth. So are you in a situation tonight in which you can praise him? Where you'd be willing to praise him? Where you'd set aside how proud you are and how tired you've been today and you've done this and you've done that and you've worked and, and you set it all aside and say, hallelujah. How many are willing to do that tonight? See, uh, one day we will. And I, I can tell you exactly why more don't. I really believe it's not that they're not inspired to do so. I believe they're embarrassed to do so. I, I, I believe, oh, well, man, that's a bunch of Pentecostals saying that they're Baptists. No, no. He deserves our praise. Yeah. Every day, 
every hour, he deserves our praise because, listen, people, if it wasn't for his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, we'd be hellbound with no, no help in sight. Yeah. Because you know what I am and what you are? You're Gentile people. And we're totally given to sin. Right. And so we ought to have, we ought to have the ability to praise our Lord. Verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. I'd love to see that. And as the voice of many waters, and I think that's languages. And as the voice of mighty thunderings, and that was loud, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. You know what? I'm not going to get upset while it's down the road. I'm not going to get upset about uh, President Biden. And listen, it makes me want to bite my tongue, but he's going to be our president. And you know what your responsibility is? It's to pray for him. He, you know what? Uh, just because he's not the man I voted for don't mean that I'm off the hook in the command of God, does it? Amen. And so, uh, yeah, that's right. what, a, what a joyful thing just to say, hey, he reigneth. He's omnipotent. You know why Biden's on his way to, hunt, uh, on his way to the uh, White House? Because God wanted him there. Mm -hmm. A lot of people give you a lot of rift about that, but, you know, uh, I certainly believe that. He raises men up and he takes them down. That's under his own. That's under his own authority, under his own jurisdiction, and he does that what seemeth good to himself. And finally, so we find here the reason these hallelujahs were being issued. They realized how powerful God was. Now I have to. I have to believe that up to this judging of the great whore, they thought she was pretty powerful. You know, uh, in the history uh, of the European countries, the Pope had more power than the king. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were pretty convinced of that, weren't they? You know what? I think about the Pope, and he's a compromise with the one they have right now. Sure. Uh, he's a man just like to me, given unto sin. I don't even know if he's ever if he's ever tasted the blessing of grace. I doubt it the way he's acting. He's nothing. He 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 has no spiritual value. And but you know they have been so deduced into believing that. I remember the first uh, thing, uh, the first time this happened to me, and it's because people are so preluded even in the United States. I was being admitted to the hospital. Don and I had only been married a year. I mean, you two were remembered on our first anniversary. I went to the hospital. And uh, so I was in there and uh, I was filling out the little mission form and it said Catholic or Protestant. And I marked out Catholic and wrote Baptist over the top of it. I said, I'm not a Protestant and I'm not a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but you know what? People are so ignorant today. That's the only two they think there is. Right. Uh, and, and so we find then that we need to remember how great our God is and identify with Him and Him alone. Now, I want you to see verse 7. Let us be glad. How often do you see that in the house of the Lord? Let us be glad and rejoice. Rejoice of who the Lord is. Give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. Now, this is my own opinion. Me and Garner Smith talked about this a lot of times. I don't think every Baptist is in the bride. Otherwise, you've got first Baptists up here, because you know what? They were organized right. I, I, I've traced their lineage. They were organized at the first Baptist church in Martin, Tennessee. And, uh, but that don't make them part of the bride. Do you, do you think it does? Think about every church in Stewart County that I think one time I counted out with the Southern Baptists and us and Elk Creek, there's about 15 Baptist churches in Stewart County. You think all of them is in the bride? Out there saying, repeat this prayer and all's going to be good? That's not in the Bible. Right. And, and how could they be a Baptist people and, uh, and, and teach such things? Well, the thing of it is, 
somewhere along the way they give up the truth and they never had to start with, I don't know. And they cannot be in the bride. She's pure, she's made herself ready, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about a name. We weren't even called Baptist until about 400 years ago. Called everything else, <laughs> we weren't called Baptist, right? And so, the ones in the bride are the best and the best. Let's give them everything they have unto the Lord. Not just Sunday, not just Wednesday night, but everything that they're, anything capable of went unto the Lord. And so she's made herself ready. She's ready for the wedding. Verse 8, And to her, the bride only, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, I would love to study into that a lot deeper, but what that says to me, again, that a halfway, halfway Baptist, listen, they're not righteous. They, don't, they have not clung to the truth. They wouldn't know Baptist truth if it knocked them down in the middle of the highway. And they are not a righteous church. They're not going to be in it. And you know, uh, I believe as a church is declining from the faith, and if you don't believe this, read the letter to the church of Laodicea. He said, I'm going to cut off. And he does. There, there are churches that are going on, and just like the Laodicea, they have big buildings, and they have, they have a Christian life center, and all that stupidity that goes with it, and they're not in the bride. And so we see that John makes it very clear by the inspiration of the Lord God that it's only certain ones. Verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed, blessed, right, blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, I haven't been to a wedding in a little while. I'm going to try to go to Bertito's this weekend, but now I have a conflict. I can't do it. But there he is the bride, the groom, and many, many guests. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I want to be in the bride, but you know what? I'd be satisfied with being a guest, wouldn't right? you? Yeah. That, that would suit me fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we turn our nose up at that, don't we? But what, what a glorious, special thing. Now, I don't know where all that falls out, but listen, being one of them at one time, I was a safe person. I didn't know all the truth. I, I didn't know uh, but beans from potatoes when it comes to spiritual things. But what a blessing to be, to be a guest. Is it not? What a wonderful thing. And, and so we find that this wonderful and glorious marriage occurs in this time, in this place. Now, what do you got to praise the Lord for? Hallelujah! What, what, what do you, and you say, well, I don't really have nothing to praise Him for. Well, you ought to be ashamed even to say that. Because you know what? You have breath of life. Amen. Your heart is beating. You know what? If you don't think that's a great blessing, you come with me in a day or two and we'll go see Joey together. And he has that machine breathing for him. You know what? Whatever his understanding level is, he knows what the breath of life is about, does he not? That's a gift. That, that's a precious, wonderful gift. And if you don't believe that, go watch someone die. Now, in the modern day, we try to keep people comfortable as we can. But especially when I was an EMT, and, you know, we weren't licensed to give drugs. Basically, you got them in the ambulance, and you prayed you got them there. And I've seen lots of people die. The most horrific thing to watch is someone struggling with their last breath. And can you, can, can you imagine <laughs> what, uh, what a wonderful thing it is not to worry about that? To be comfort, comfortable in the face of eternity. 
I'm okay with it. If, you know what? If I don't make it to the nursing home tonight, glory be to God, I'll be home with Him forever with the Lord. And, and so we find there's so many things that we ought to be able to praise God for. Now, very quickly, I want you to go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Everybody knows this is one of my favorite accounts of some, the Lord saving someone. Acts 16. And you don't see bells and whistles. You don't hear people screaming. She did not get a heavenly vision of Christ like Paul did. But it was a very simplistic thing. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. The Bible simply says this. And a certain woman. He's dealing with the specifics. He's dealing with individuals. And a certain woman named Lydia, the seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God. Now, I want you to notice this, that she had that religion. I think Lydia was probably Jewish. Maybe not, because she lived in Thyatira, which was a Grecian city. But she had something, and she worshiped God. And the only reason I say it, she probably worshiped Jehovah, that it is capital G in your King James Bible. And I think if it was something less than that, it'd be a little G. And, and, and so she worshipped, but she didn't know God. You know, I think there's a lot of people in that situation today, don't you? Just bent up with energy and ready to go and never really even known the Christ of the Bible. And, and, and so we find then that Lydia is one of those individuals in that situation. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Now, I want you to notice two critical things that has to be there. She had to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why I'm not primitive Baptist? Because I believe that the preaching of the word availeth much. If I didn't believe you didn't have to hear the gospel to be saved, you know what I'd run in there and join in with? But I don't. I believe you must hear the preaching of the gospel. And then secondly, the all accountable, the, everything hinges on it. The heart, the Lord of it. You know what? If that's not there, church, you're still lost. It, it, if he has never by his miraculous ability opened your heart to the wonderful truth that he is Savior alone, dear friend, you're still lost. You're in desperate need. Even before tonight, seek the Lord while he may be found. Because you know what? This is the truth. We never, we never know really if we have another day ahead of us or not. And so we find then that Lydia is saved. Notice in verse 15, and when she was baptized and her household, now that's where you Presbyterians get baptized with babies, but it doesn't say she had a baby, does it? I have a bunch of children, but I don't have a baby. And when she was baptized and her household, she saw us saying, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she said, and she constrained us or required that we do it. So we see the fruits of salvation. Have you really been saved? If, if you have, you got something to say hallelujah about. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter number 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. We're just going to read one verse, verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28, the Bible says this, And God hath set some in the church. He didn't set all, that's why they're a marriage guest. And he hath set some in the church, first apostles, and that office is gone away with, secondarily prophets or preachers is what we call them, thirdly, uh, thirdly teachers, after that miracles. He said, well, I don't think miracles is a modern-day teaching. Well, if you saw me fly away in that helicopter a couple months ago, you'd be, you'd be believing in miracles. If he's really saved your soul, you will believe in miracles. Because there was nothing conjured up by you, I will guarantee you that. 
I've seen miracles in my life. And so he placed those in the church. And then uh, very quickly, I want to read just a couple other places. I mean, a couple other things in the church and the gifts of helpings. That's something we don't do a whole lot. Helps. We think everybody's moochers, don't we? Governments. Governments in the church. Now, all of you know that for some years I have really been struggling with this verse because the Bible says God placed some in the church. And how do we place them in there? I don't want to take on the, the responsibility of God, do you? But notice just a little further down it says governments. You know what? We need the church to be ruled well. And because man is what man is, the only way to do that is set up some form of government. And we have that. Uh, and, and, and so we find then that the Lord God placed us in the church. If you're a member of New Testament Baptist Church or Sunnyview Baptist Church or wherever he's placed you tonight, you know what? Give God the praise for it and don't give those individuals that go to you in the praise for it. Don't give a preacher so-and-so the praise for it. You know why you're in one of the Lord's churches? Because of the goodness of God. That would make you say hallelujah. Amen. I'm in a church. I'm in one of the Lord's churches. Hallelujah. But how thankful of that are we really? I don't think too much. Greg in. Greg in. President Trump's not going to be president anymore. Well, so what? We're here to worship God, not President Trump. Right. We're here to lift up the name of Jesus. And, and we should always be excited and, and ready to do that and, and ready to praise His name again and again and again and again and give Him glory for who He is. Uh, second, uh, second Peter, I'm trying to. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and we'll end up there. Ephesians chapter 4. We're just going to read verse 30 for time's sake. The Bible just simply says this. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So, I want you to see uh, that the sealing of ourselves and listen, I believe of a surety, if you're not sealed, you're open to demonic possession. You know what the Bible says? Uh, and I was going to read tonight, but lack of time. It said, Mary Magdalene went to the sepulcher of Jesus, and this is what her note was, of whom was cast out seven devils. You know what? Demonic possession is as real today as it was in the days of Christ. And you know what? Uh, I fully believe I've seen it. I mean, you, you look in the eyes of people, and, and, and they're just not there. They cut somebody from ear to ear and not even think about it. You know, the only thing I can come to is that they're demonically possessed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and listen, as a church, we need to acknowledge that because, listen, you, you, you know, he'll send people among us to bear false witness, won't they? And so we, uh, we see then that, first of all, that that ceiling is there. And then according to this, and grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby or by Him you are sealed in the day of redemption. So it seems to me that the ceiling comes from the Holy Ghost. And the only way I can put my mind around that, see, what makes us different than most people, most people that put Baptists over the door, is we believe with a surety that he has to come by and be real to you. That we can't follow the Romans road, we can't ABC, we can't invite him into our hearts, that it's purely a work of grace. Mm -hmm. And that only comes by the Holy Ghost. Uh, see, we can't read a book and learn about God. Right. Yeah, before the Lord saved, did you ever try to read the Bible? I did. You know what it was? It was just as dry as a grain cracker. 
didn't mean nothing to me. But after the Lord saved me, I'd get in that book and it would be precious to me. And then after I got in one of the Lord's true churches, man, I, I couldn't keep my face out of it. See, there's a good earmarker of your relationship with the Lord. Do you crave that book or do you not? Now, uh, I crave it in preaching. I crave it to just read it by myself. I, I crave it to hear people singing and the goodness of God. And if I didn't, I think there'd be a big problem somewhere, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. But now, I'm going to say this and we're going to close. I've been in a state where I was saved and I had no interest whatsoever in that book. And I tell you why, I was swept away by the world. Now, my story being in the world and your story may be a lot different. Um, Y'all know uh, hothead and the whole bit. But you know what? Religion can make you just as a vile person as drinking and smoking pot. Do you ever think about that? Because religion is going to leave you empty. You, you know what that lifestyle? I look around my three surviving friends that still about it. They look so empty. They look so helpless. I see them on Facebook and I'm going, thank you, God. Thank you. But, and I won't use groups, uh, but I was looking today, I love to hear gospel music, so I was, I was searching for a sp specific song, and the Gaither vocal, when he has those, when all the groups get together, and I was looking at them, listening to the song, and some of them was just like blank stairs. They was singing, but you could tell yeah. it went there. Yeah. Was, and, and so what I'm saying is, you can be in a very good rank group of people. You can be in a nice sound church and be just as unconnected as I was out in the world. Because see, if you're not saved, genuinely saved, He saved you. You don't have nothing. Uh, <laughs> Just like the man, just like the, uh, the one that cleaned his house. And the old demonic spirit said, came back to seven more wicked than himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a dangerous place to be in, is it not? Mm -hmm. I think we got a lot of empty houses today. And you can see it through their empty eyes. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. And so we ought to be able to say hallelujah. Amen. If you understand him and you know him, hallelujah. And praise you throughout the ceaseless ages. If you ain't going to do it now, get revved up because you're doing it on the other side.